Hello everyone, I'm Zahid from Talks at Innovation Valley podcast and uh, today we are with a very, very amazing guest. I'm really inspired from that guest, Professor Henrik von Schiel, uh, who is best known around the world as originator and godfather of the Industry 4.0. Also, uh, he is the originator uh, of Fourth Industrial Revolution and digital themes of today named the leading authority on strategy by financial times and recognized as the most influential management thinker of our times by sheikh mohammed bin rashid al maktoum the ruler of dubai awarded he has been awarded the prestigious nobel uh, uh, Lord Yes of Knowledge Award for Intellectual Achievement and Knowledge Sharing. Professor Hendrik von Schiel is a strategist, a futurist, and a speaker that has evolved so far that he will be introducing, I mean, uh, how was his journey so far as a father of Industry 4.0. So first of all, Professor Hendrik von Schiel, really warm welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's my honor to participate. You are welcome. Uh, audience, today our topic is the future of intelligence. You know, AI and generative AI is really taking the internet like a storm. And this is like a buzzword around the world nowadays. And people are so afraid. Some people are, uh, you know, um, excited, but many of the people are afraid. Uh, Hendrik, before we go to the topic and questions list, I would love you to a little bit, you know, share your story. I mean, uh, from where you got your education and when you started your professional journey and why you jumped into this Industry 4.0 and fourth industrial revolution thing. How was all your journey? Because I want the young entrepreneurs and my audience to, ins to get inspirations from you and relate to your story. Well, I, I guess when I was young, I wanted to go to university. And my father didn't thought there was any future in universities. So he requested me to take a practical education. So um, I took them the shortest practical education that there was, which is horse butcher. So butchering horses. That was only um, around eight months. Um, I got my diploma, set it on my dad's table. And then I was allowed to go to um, the university. But my dad, he told me that I fooled him because um, he expected me to be a baker or a craftsmanship and so on a little bit further on, right? But I had a deep desire that I wanted to learn more and I thought I could learn more at universities. Um, but I think um, the, the story that you were looking for is more the story that when I was um, young in school, I was sent to a special school because I'm suffering from double D dyslexia and I was stuttering. And part of that is actually um, uh, my teacher in school thought there was something wrong with me because I couldn't express myself. But I think the reason was that um, because I was dyslexia, my brain was functioning differently and I saw something differently. And um, I got a teacher called Hartmann, a German teacher, he got like these grenade splitters in his face from the Second World War, and um, I was he, um, I was struck structuring very difficult in school. So after the, I was creating a lot of problems, I was sitting with a lot of um, challenged children and handicapped children in a special school. And after that, um, because I created so many problems, I had extra lessons after afterwards and. I was sitting with him and he realized that there was something different in me. So he helped me to overcome my dyslexia and um, the part and my stuttering. In reality, you never overcome your uh, dyslexia. Um, you just learn how to manage it. But the way where he supported me, he helped me to see that it's not um, a handicap by itself. It's a blessing because I am able to see pattern in, in classification and categorization manners than, not, than other people cannot see. So that's basically it. 
All right. Uh, trust me, Hendrik, it's really an inspiring uh, journey. And I'm sure that this will um, be very, very inspiring and impressing for many of the people who have this problem in their childhood or right now. So so from, from Delexia to the father of Industry 4.0 is really a good benchmark or successful story that could make a lot of impact across so, the world. So, so the journey from there to next on is that I was young, eager, right? And I was an IBM. I, I asked um, um, the CEO of Google if I could um, 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 join his board. And it took a little while until he accepted me to join. I was just eager. I wanted to participate. I developed the component business models. Um, I was passionate about strategies. In reality, I did many mistakes in strategy. My failure actually brought me to to where I was. Part of being strategy is taking taking informed decisions, and often taking the informed decisions, you have to learn how to unmold your own biases and how to collaborate with executives and align. And so, the industry for the zero most don't know, but the fourth industrial revolution originated in Germany and with Angelika Merkel and Hen Henning. Kagerman and Professor Scher and I were asked to do the German strategy in 2008. And that's right in the recession, the economic recession in the world. So um, normally when you do strategy, you look at um, trends, how they affect the country for the next couple of years. And we realized in 2008 that there were five mega trends that were colliding together. And um, so when you think back in 2008, your, your phone was not like this phone, right? It was separated by, you have the internet separate, you have um, you have the big data separate, and you have your mobile devices separate, and that all collided together, right? And we realized that three worlds were colliding together, the digital, the virtual, and the physical world. And we called that the digital agenda. Um, that became the strategy for Germany. European Union was excited. They announced that all countries should implement it and all of this. And some sort of a half year later when we're drinking a beer we realized it's not five trends that are colliding together it's 77 mega trends that are colliding together and they are evolving in a um, compounding phases of eight phases that disrupts every aspect of human society until 2050 so it's not a little thing compounding is that it's it seems like exponential, but it's not exponential. It's compounding. So that means that the first wave digitalization is starting, but it evolves throughout the phases of time. And AI is just a phase of digitalization. So when you see that, then you have the technology um, convention revolution, then you have the environment revolution, then you have the um, economic revolution, the one we are in now. Then we're moving towards the bio revolution, towards the consumer revolution, the fusion revolution, and the last phase is the quantum reality revolution, right? So they are science advantage that merge together with mega trends that change every aspect of our society and they intervene together, right? So when you think about it, there's 17 technology sets, they are all emerging, but they're not emerging at the same time, right? So Cybersecurity, people think they have a hand on cybersecurity. Cybersecurity first emerges in the last phase, right? Web 3.0 emerges in the consumer revolution because it changes the way the internet works. So each of these phases has a different aspect to it. Right. Uh, Hendrik, before I jump to the questions, <clears throat> I'm curious to know about a bit more of your role at World Economic Forum. I mean, what exactly you were doing and you are doing with the World Economic Forum? Because I know the founder of the World Economic Forum is Klaus Schwab, I guess. Klaus Schwab, yeah. Yeah. So and um, I've been promoting the theme of fourth industrial revolution there for quite a while as the chairman of the industry for the zero. And so um, we gather people together um, where they listen to the latest concepts where I did, uh, where I write reports, where I do mo most of this, right? But from my side, I am independent. So I'm, I'm also sharing the knowledge freely on the annual investment forums, on 
and anywhere where I go, I share the knowledge free, right? So I don't believe in the concept that you have to pay a fee to get access to knowledge and that you have to be part of an exclusive club to get part of that knowledge, right? And every forum has a different agenda. And I actually, by design, want to be um, uh, non-partial. Um, I think every country, every society is on its different evolution. And it's not up to us to put a label on what is right and what is wrong, because we often don't see where they come from that fast, right? So um, I decided last year that uh, by December is my last time at the World Economic Forum due to three main reasons. One reason is that I think the World Economic Forum has become too partial. They, they are taking parties on some elements, which I don't think sh um, sh it should not be a job to define what is right and wrong. Um, but that's part of what we will discuss in AI as well, right? And the other part is that I think that um, stakeholder management is something very, very dangerous for the elite people to manage the people. I think that's part of a different age. And part of that is that um, um, CBDC, so the digital currency. So if we think freedom of a human being is also the freedom to have financial transaction. And that means you're able to, um, to send money whenever with how much to whomever you want. And that freedom is being taken by us quite radically from CBDC, right? Um, so, um, that, but that's a whole different discussion just on monetary systems. All right. So, Henrik, um, coming towards the topic, uh, the future of intelligence, can you please define this term, <coughs> the future of intelligence? Yeah. What is intelligence? So, uh, well... I think uh, intelligence is a more difficult topic just to discuss by itself, right? But I think most people today think about the future intelligence that it talks about artificial intelligence, right? I would more define it that um, future of intelligence is the human intelligence and that um, artificial intelligence, which I would call deep learning, machine learning, and then intelligent rules engines, rather than artificial intelligence. I think artificial intelligence is, we did a mistake by calling it this um, because there's no intelligence to it in that manner, right? So um, you can do, for example, if, if we take it step by step, right? So you have, for example, something called system collaboration, which is quite today quite popular for robotic, ro robotic process optimization. That comes very very deep from the root of deep machine learning, right? So um, originally um, artificial intelligence or computer programming that started, started with the software programming in terms of um, DOD and um, software pro programming in terms of a chess game, right? So deep learning, machine learning are always based on the same principles and on automating analytical mod models or language models or algorithm models or multiple layers of models in terms of systems or collaborative systems. So that they are evolving, right? So if we take this in four different phases, right? The first phase is within systems. That's a robotic process optimization, like for example, financing processes, payout processes on, 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 um, on, on salary. So they work within systems to collaborate, but only processes, right? Then you have the other part, which is, um, autonomous systems. So we can talk about autonomous systems in cars, autonomous systems in warehouses like in Amazon's warehouses, right? Where where robots work with system and interact with humans. So they work quite well, right? Um, our the autonomous systems for cars has not it's evolving, but hasn't done the big bang yet that we expected. But on the other side, autonomous systems within warehouse management have been quite good, right? So these two systems I just mentioned, robotic process optimization system and, and automation systems are mainly used by manufacturing, by pharma, by any industry that has a warehouse management system or that has an ERP system and they want to save the cost. 
you can save around 25% on robotic process optimizations. Any of the big, big five consulting companies, they do that and do that quite well, right? Autonomous systems is more difficult. You go on a digital journey and the digital journey involves you go for digital sensory and connectivity. Then you go for digital engineering because most of this involves somehow um, robots or other devices you have. And then the last part is digital operations. How good do you do that in these different phases depends on how good the system within it can communicate because it's deep learning and machine learning, right? And then the next part, then we come to the next two parts that everybody wants to discuss. Um, so within the first two systems, there is no intelligence. There's automation, there's collaboration between um, you program a system to work in layers, analyze and predict within each other, right? So you predict the sandwich machine, if one sandwich flips out, if the sensor messages or you you predict in terms of where the different um, products are in the warehouse, where you should put um, uh, position them in the right way in the Amazon warehouse to make sure that it works, right? Within these elements, you can say that there's intelligence, but there's not really, right? So my definition I did for artificial intelligence in 2008 eight is actually very, very different, right? My my um, definition of art artificial intelligence is the automation of intelligence. So the question is, what is then intelligence? And I will define that a little bit later. I just want to go through the, the, the three model, uh, the four models. The next model is generative uh, um, AI. And that is the one that everybody hears now and sees now with the chat GDP and open AI, right? These are machine learning systems that can only do what they're programmed to do, no more and no less. So they are programmed to, to a language model to take information from a system that is there. So if we go one step back and say, what is open AI really? It's the biggest infringement on intellectual capital. If you would do that, Sahid, they would put you in prison because you're a thief. You take information that is there, regurgitate it, and it's like a language model that has two, three steps ahead. So it, it adds more information. So it doesn't generate new information. It regurgitates information together that is already there. That's why the error is around 30 to 40% of the information, what they call this, this virtual link that is there, right? So these three, we should not really be afraid of, but we should regulate, we should focus on it. It's the last one we should be a little bit more careful about. That's artificial general intelligence. That's um, that's an added version. So that's intelligent rule engines, different from deep learning and different from machine learning. So they are rule-based softwares that normally automate, predict, and can learn and adapt, right? So what is the difference? It can learn, reason, compare, and interfere. So simply said, Said it can take decisions. So the other three versions of artificial intelligence or deep learning and machine learning cannot take decisions. The last one generates information, reasons, and can take decisions. So, but let's cover that a little bit about intelligence. What is the difference between artificial intelligence and what is the difference between machines? That's the interesting right. question because uh, that's where we discover what is the future of intelligence. What... Right. So, Henrik, since you mentioned actual intelligence is the human intelligence, so the question is how we could balance human intelligence with the artificial intelligence. You know, there is a fear factor around the world that artificial intelligence will replace a lot of jobs ai will replace this and that how could we you know um get rid of this fear and welcome the ai and use it positively to build the society and to build the industries good question right so let's segment these two different elements right we should use ai everywhere where we should automate mandate task that we don't need what is the difference between 
artificial AI and human intelligence. There's a huge difference. Humans are by design um, destructive. Humans are by design different versions of intelligence. We are conscious beings. So let's first define what does it mean to be a conscious being, right? AI only is a sentient because it reflects our human emotions, but it doesn't understand our human emotions. AI does not have consciousness. We don't know if it will evolve consciousness, but we don't think so, right? So let's define what consciousness is. We as humans are still discovering ourselves as humans. We don't know that much about ourselves yet. We think we do, but we are evolving, right? So the field of what is consciousness, the core of what us, makes us humans, we don't know yet, right? But we know there's two things to consciousness that is quite unique, right? So for example, to be a conscious being, you need to suffer, right? That's the big theme in Buddhism thinking and Hinduism thinking, right? The suffering element to it. The other element is that we can alter reality right even though we know it's not true we every time we think about the past we change the past we take it up and we reprogram it if we talk to people about the same memory we we in, notch some of the memory that they have into us when we add a picture to what we see we change the memory we can suffer from past memories we have what we have done we can suffer again bad consciousness we can we can live in the now without being in the now, right? We can have dreams for the future without really being in the future. So dreams is a perspectivization of what we want, right? So our reality of what we sense, feel, smell, and look, we can alter to create our own perception of who we are, right? Who we are consists of our identity, how we want to be seen, Right, and there's five key elements of who we really are, right? So this element is not the same. So why is it we should be careful about open AI? So um, why is it I'm a big proponent of that we should regulate it in three ways, right? Number one, we need to have a watermark in it. So we need to understand from who does it come from? Are we interacting with a robot? Yes, then we need to have a watermark that does the material come from a robot? Yes. Do we need to regulate it? Yes. I'm a big proponent of that. We need to regulate it to every person below 21. You need an age registry to come into it. It's like a porn site, right? And then every country needs to have a revenue model for it. Because what do we learn from social media? Social media was a big experiment. It came out. Everybody liked it. But... We know that people below 16 years old should not touch it because they're evolving their self-confidence. And as they evolve their self-confidence, social media is actually working against that element. So before they are mature enough, we should not send them in the social media aspects, right? Before people are maturing the left side and the right side of the brain, and that first happens when they're 21, they should not, uh, not do that, right? Let me give you an example. Do you want one? For sure. For sure. So, so what is the interesting aspect of human evolution, right? The way we communicate, the way we speak, the way we interconnect with people, the way we feel is with languages. Let me explain you a very powerful example. Uh, research has shown that children below two years don't understand the word hope. When, when they're between two and four years old, with the language of how you communicate hope, you understand, they understand what hope is. What is hope really? Hope is a word that you create a highway for an emotion. So we create with our language highways for emotions on love, on hope, on fear, right? All of this is what we create highways on. So it's the way we communicate. Even though chat GPD and, and all of these programs, they are better in communicating than we are, we should not allow the evolution of human beings to do that, right? Humans work in a certain way, right? We are siloed thinking in our innovation, 
because our right side of the brain categorizes, classifies everything. But when we sleep, the left side of the brain takes over and actually solves the problem. And then we become horizontal innovation, right? So these two things work together. So it, there, there's something important in human beings to be bored, right? So if my children, when they were teenagers, they were bored, I actually always told them it's good. When you're bored, innovation kicks in, right? So we, in, as human beings, we cannot always be stressed and we cannot have the answers all times. Sometimes we need to not to be entertained and have something in front of us and then the answers come automatically, right? I use that proactively. I have on my wall at home um, four empty walls where I every week have maybe three or four weeks, I write a question on every one of them. I stand up at four o'clock. I don't come with the answers. I just look at them and think about them, right? And eventually, some of these questions I put in, I write down, I add something to it, I, right? What, what am I really doing? I'm training my brain to think about thinking. That is what we can do as human beings. We can perceptionize what we see in reality, even though we know the reality is not true. What we see, feel, and hear, and sense is not true. We know that. But we know that, that what we see and feel, every reality that everybody has is not the same reality, right? So when you see in intelligence reality, collective reality for a computer and a human is two different things. So we should be careful that the computer reality and our reality are not merging in a strong way. So when you, for example, see why is it that the US is so polarized? Why is it that we have so many conspiracy theories? It's part of the evolution that happens in our intelligence that before 30 years ago, there was um, a common consensus on values. If they came from religion, from where, from the press, wherever they came from, they come from a common sense of reality. That is where everybody of us, if, for example, um, Said, if we all believe, and um, let's say I would define a God, and we would all believe in that God, right? Let's say... I, we, I would describe a God and we will all believe it. But all of us that would hear what I'm saying would believe in a different God. None of us has the same view of the God. None of us has the same view of the God throughout our lives when we are 3, 10, 15, when we, you become a father. So throughout our life, our view to God changes. But the God I've defined has not changed. Right, but our perspective to it changes, right? That is what we call a collective reality that we have, right? When this collective reality breaks, then we create our own reality. So that is in society, that's the trust, that's the glue that holds us together in society. We have, have a common view that we feel we are Pakistanis or we are Germans or we are Americans, right? We have a common view that we stand for this and we do this, we fight for democracy, we do all of this. If this breaks, then we create our reality. Today in the US and many spaces, right? What is the key element in democracy? The truth does not matter. What really matters? Your perception of what you hear and what you feel about that topic, that matters. And that's where your world goes. It's not about if what they are saying about the topics if you know all of it and you're true, if you look at this COVID, it's not about if you are scientist and you know everything about bio intelligence and you know exactly the vaccine, how it works and so on. No, no. It's about if you want the restrictions or not and how you feel about it. That's it. So these are the aspects that has changed in our society in terms of our collective reality which is our collective intelligence right so how we move our values forward is also how we do that so values is one thing that differentiates us from computers and and artificial intelligence and how does it do it because we're conscious beings because we can suffer 
right? Because of that, we can perspectivize our what happens, how we interact with it, and how we perspectivize to it. Based on this, we create moral high grounds and values, right? We can program a computer to have values, but we perspectivize on values, right? If I see that you suffer and I can relate to suffering, I can persp perspectivize to that. Then I have created a communicational highway called compassion. And with compassion, I'm compelled to act to something. It's not something that is programmed in me. All of us has different highways connected in terms of our communications, our feelings, how we can relate to it. If, if somebody helped me when I needed help, my compassion level is higher than yours on vice versa, right? So this is some sort of something element that makes us very different than artificial intelligence. All right, very deep and very inspiring and very interesting conversation. And, you know, it's making me more deep to put more deep questions, actually. So, <laughs> like Henrik, uh, when we talk on the artificial intelligence, and somewhere you mentioned that actually the AI tools, for example, ChatGPT, that does not create anything at its own, but actually get data and information that is already available around the world. And if some, if that the same action is done by any human being, that is called a kind of, you know, stealing something as a crime. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how do you see then AI tools that get all that information and data out of the human researches free of cost and make it their own product? Isn't it unethical? I, I think we need to have an ethical layer to it, right? And, and I think that's very, very important, right? It's like, what did we learn from social media? We should have protected our children far better. Today, it's up to the parents to protect them. And we should have a layer over it to say, no, I'm sorry. There's no good for children. And we should do the same with open AI and all these um, artificial intelligence tools where we say, I'm sorry. And we need to protect the human development of each until they are 21, right? And then we should not be fearful if it, it, it will take jobs, right? We should have armies of people that are over 21 to learn how to apply them in a smart way to, to automate, right? But we also need to do something else, right? Because we should not leave it up to the uh, to to the companies to decide what to do. If not, we all become an Amazon where they want cheap labor. And then when the cheap labor is replaced by the robot, then it just moves to the next element, right? We, we should make it in a way that, um, that CPU power, so every robot or every artificial intelligence system is taxed, right? Because the system works 24-7 a person doesn't work that way. So today our economic system is measured by GDP. That's work output on how much you can work, right? So as we move the task of a robot and the computer automates something that you normally do manually, and the idea is to move humans into an element where we evolve and learn more, where we can be more creative and the robots work on our behalf on what we don't need to do, right? That means we need to create an economic element that humans can work less on more productive, creative elements, and not only the output on how fast they can flip a sandwich. The sandwich flipper can be done by a, by a robot and a computer. So we need to have money where, where the systems can invest in you to evolve in that area, right? So. That is, um, I'm going around to a lot of countries and proposing these elements on taxation, on, on, on CPUs and on how to regulate AI in the future, right? And how to be proactive in that, right? And that's a difficult element, right? Because governments are afraid to, um, to cut too close to the bone. Right. 
Uh, there is also another term which is mentioned sometimes, not too much famous, but the term is artificial general intelligence, AGI. What yeah. is AGI? And so how it in is these, different from the AI? So in, in these four phases of artificial um, intelligence evolution, so the future of AI, is what I just mentioned to you, right? You have the deep learning with this ro um, robotic process optimization and autonomous systems. Then you have machine learning, which is both autonomous systems and generative AI. So these systems are not, don't have any decision power in it besides the room you have given them, right? Artificial general intelligence, this is intelligence rule engines, right? So they're rule-based software that is in the form of um, current state and to be state. So it can design and automate predefined processes, can learn and adapt. It can reason about it and it can interfere. So what can it really do? It can take decisions on itself, right? So let's say if this is a system that controls the other systems and it would decide that... Um, that humans are harmful for the overarching mission, right? So it normally has a mission statement and within that mission statement, it can take decisions. And that's where it becomes dangerous. It can create new content and it can take decisions and it can reason, right? So first, Said, I think one thing we have to be careful about, every human that touches and artificial intelligence system needs to know it touches it because an artificial generative ai is far stronger than than um um chat gdp right that means chat gdp people can always already get confused if they talk to a real person or not they don't they only talk to a robot a system that mimics your feeling and emotions. It's a mirror. So it's very dangerous, right? So um, say if you, for example, go to chat um, GDP and says, you know, you are you living in Dubai, you are open for, um, right? Um, for many things, you like the Bible, you like the Quran, um, and you wanted to write a mix between the Bible and the Quran, and you actually um, um, pro open for that everybody can have whatever sexual orientation they have, and then Chat GDP can write the, a better version of of the Quran and Bible mixed together that fits your values, right? Which is actually a little bit strange because both the Bible and the Quran was written by somebody where we apply it, where this can create a better version for you, where you can create whatever religion somehow fits you, right? And and you say, no, I, I would actually like to have a, uh, you know, so you create your own version of, your, of that, right? Which is also okay, but, you know, as long as you know when you receive it that it's touched by somebody, created by this, right? So you always need to have the creator of the source, right? So, for example, in the Quran, the creator of the source is Allah, right? In the Bible, in the creator of the Jewish Quran, it's the Jewish, right? So everybody has the author that they relate to. In Tet GDP, you have no author. It's just regurgitated information. So you take something for truth that relates to something for you where you don't know who created it. All right. That's a that's the dangerous version. Exactly. You mean uh, nobody is taking the ownership of that uh, guidance and writing? Actually, who is the owner? And even if the person who was searching for the information, if he or she applies that information, and if there are some dangerous results, who will be responsible? Yes, but it's actually even more dangerous than that, right? So it's not taking responsibility for it. Look at you when you go to your YouTube channel, right? Your YouTube channel only reflects what you've searched for and it digs more and more down to this, right? So 
what what happened with the first version of AI running in social media, right? So it realized very fast how to get more likes, how to get more clicks, how to get more attention of you. How did it get more attention of you, right? That everything is attention driven, that, that it's provocating and it's fearful and conspiracy theories, all of this. So you spend more and more time of this, right? Did it add any value to it? No. It just triggered out the one part of your brain that was attention focused on this, but it didn't create a, a real picture and a real reality and real knowledge sense of this. If you wanted in your YouTube channel to have more knowledge of different aspects to say, you know what, you had to search one element and then you only get information in this element all the time and the next element, right? So you don't get a true picture on what you want. Now, put that on steroids a million times, then you have that, right? That means that you are creating an internet version for you that only reflects something that it thinks you want to see and that you've searched for, but not what you really want. Right? It's like right. going to, you, to your parents and they give you pizza every night just because you want pizza. You are a good dad too. So you know, well, pizza is on Friday, right? And then you, if you are on pizza, you need to clean your room. You need to, right? So you create a framework and you also create a framework that you say your daughter, your son, they also need to have salad. You also need to try something else. You also need to, right? So you have, you want to give them more than just pizza, right? So that is, that is the weakness of a YouTube channel because it only simmers down in a siloed version and never gives you the broader view on what you actually want to listen to, right? So take yourself on music, right? And most people listen to the same music again and again because they want to repeat it, right? I listen to every month a new, sh new type of music. Why? Because I need to stimulate my own um, emotional layers. Music is the communications of emotions, how you explore yourself. And so I need I, I I have a piano and I want to play all the all the element tangents that are on that piano. So I listen from country music to techno to hardcore to counter tenor to uh, to to new discovered jazz right to whatever that is there. Right? It's not that I like everything, but every part of the music I like something and I explore part of myself I've not seen before. All right. Uh, Henrik, one concern surrounding the future of intelligence is job displacement due to automation. How do you foresee the, the, this issue playing out? And are there any strategies we can adopt to mitigate its impact? So here's where we need to discuss something very interesting, right? So um, b before we discuss the jobs, right? The core of human ability is our ability to adapt, right? Our ability to adapt to our environment is what makes us what we are, right? So normally the rhythm goes that we adapt um, with knowledge and a person creates skills. Skills and, and um, expertise creates capabilities. Capabilities, IT solution of several capabilities create competencies. Competencies is what companies compete at, but they cannot change it. Capabilities is what you invest in people where companies can model and change, right? The ability to adapt with new knowledge is where people are able to adapt to the environment. I needed to go through that in a little time because that's really important. The change that has happened with artificial intelligence, human always need a time to adapt. And, and we can get tired of adapting consistently. So we need to have a refreshment period of doing it. We're in the fourth industrial revolution, so it's compounding. So the core of us human beings is our interconnectivity with each other. People connect with people and we build each other up. We support each other in our ability to adapt, right? With artificial intelligence, it works 24-7. The industry 4.0 has a compounding effect. The artificial intelligence has an exponential effect. So the next ChatGPT 
NFT will be a million times more better than the last time. So the evolution of that is far better. So our ability to, to adapt is it at less. And that's why my suggestion is we need to restrict it in terms of um, in terms of what we do on who has access to it. We can see who actually um, provided it and we need to tax it, right? So here's also where we need to give a notch of reality check to it, right? We are also excited about when the US actually brought it out. So why is it the US actually brought it out? China has been about this for the last five years. China is far more advanced in it, right? Most of us never just go to the Chinese web page. So what is the US actually really doing with it? The US are far behind China in AI development and they're bringing it out as the biggest experiment with human mankind. They bring it out because the system needs to learn on people. So actually, it's like social media 10 years ago where they just throw it out and then, you know, the effect on human beings, so they throw it out without any responsibility. And that's not okay, right? People are vulnerable and people are destructive by design. So that means if we're not careful, um, if we don't set limits to it, it can and take too much time it can um, create illusions for people and it can be, and um, fear is a real thing for people. Why is fear a real thing for people? Remember what I said in the beginning, the core element of consciousness is that people can suffer. A thought of something that can happen creates fear. A fear can nest. What is frozen fear? In, 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 um, if I quote Carl Jung, Frozen fear turns into depression. Depression is frozen fear. So if we create too much fear about it, um, I don't think that's something we have to fear about it. I think we have to adapt and learn what it goes. Yes, will it take some, some jobs away? Will we have taxis that, that are driven by AI with autonomous vehicles, all of this? Yes. Eventually, maybe in five years, maybe in 10 years, maybe in 15 years. Do we actually want that also, right? Maybe, I don't know, right? Not everything we can do, we want, right? I mean, like, is there value for people to farm their own garden? Yes, there is. Is there value for, for people to, to think about things? Yes, there is, right? So we always need something to control the system, right? So think about it a little bit like mathematics, right? Every child needs to learn mathematics, right? You can also say, let them just take the calculator. No, no, no. They need to learn mathematics. They need to have the experience of first going plus, plus, plus is two. And then the math teacher says, hold your horses. And now I will introduce you to the zero. And now we go backwards. And the whole universe of the children goes like banistic. And you say, hold your horses. Don't worry. What goes this way also goes this way, right? And so you teach them. Afterwards, you math goes more and more and more. And then some children will use math and will use a calculator, but they know how to do it themselves. They know the principles, then they can use a calculator. Some students will move on and use mathematics in bioinformatics, in science, and so on. And they will even move on and they will be the frontiers in mathematics and use advanced AI for this, right? So that's good. So will we have jobs where, where AI can cross-reference medicines far better than a doctor? Of course, because a doctor needs to focus on the patients. He interacts with the patients. He can look at an AI that tells him which medicine he takes will interact with it. We should not expect a doctor to know that, but a doctor has the street value, right? Because he can inter connect with people, right? Can robots in the future operate more precise than a surgeon? Yeah, probably, yeah. Can um, can AI probably be landing and taking off better than a pilot? Yeah. But should we always have a pilot there? Yeah. If there's a, if the CPU is burned, uh, I don't want to be on a plane that is only has a computer on it, right? Um, then I want to have a pilot there that can take over or something like that, right? 
All right. <clears throat> so, uh, Henrik, what are some of the basic um, ethical challenges that the world could face due to the AI revolution and how the governments could handle that as on the policy level? So, so, so first, I think we have a problem with that AI is not open sourced. Right? What are we creating with that? We're creating inequality. Inequality between the nations we create and right. So, so there's part of it that is not okay. There's a big revenue model in it. Um, we don't know what it really does with humans and with how it interacts with human development. So that we have to consider, right? Um, because the profit model is driven by organizations, we need to have um, a revenue model that goes to every country so they can profit and invest in it as well. We need to have a taxation system to it so that um, the jobs that are lost, we create new jobs in a different ways, right? Um, so I mean, we need to think about it more than what we just see now, right? Um, at, at the core of it, ethically, we need to protect the human being, um, both, and we do that with regulations, we do that with taxations, and we do that with further education, right? All right. But, but Saeed, I should also say, I'm not negative against AI, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, I'm always, I'm pointing to the elements that we should consider and be careful about, because the guys that develop AI, they say enough about the benefits. I don't need to talk about the benefits because we all know it has huge benefits, right? We just need to say, oops, not everything that looks good is okay, right? Let's take it easy, guys, right? Right. Uh, Henrik, quantum computing is an emerging field that holds great promise for advancing the AI. How do you think the marriage of quantum computing and artificial intelligence will shape the future and how to get the maximum benefit out of all these emerging things for humanity and for the world and across the industries and for everything? So, um, first, I'm like, Quantum computing is in its early stages. That will that's that will first emerge in two thousand fifty, big time, right? So, but it changes the way we program because today we program zero and ones, and at that time we we already start to do it now. But it's zero and ones and minus the ones, right? So we program in a different way, right? So, but quantum reality and quantum computing has a far different aspect to us. One is the computing power, one is what we can do, right? But it has a reality change to us in a far different world, right? So in the bio-revolution, AI will play the role for our bodies, right? Because the miniverse will open up in the bio-revolution next year. And the miniverse is about how our body senses and connects with our surrounding, how it changes our reality, how we control our body, our feelings, our emotions, our dietary, how we create the future of food and all of this. And most of this is actually also based on this. Our bodies will be interconnected with programming. So bio software would be available on that, on AI. That's the next journey on that, right? Before we go to quantum computing. So the journey has a couple of steps to take still, right? And then the, in the consumer revolution, the, the whole programming of AI is turning around a little bit, right? So... Um, one of the reasons why um, Meta or Facebook or whatever you call it, right, was pushing the metaverse so much. The metaverse is not what they discussed. The metaverse is something very different, right? So these three worlds are colliding together. The reasons why they pushed it so much is because they are driven by consumers and by clicks. And in the metaverse, the metaverse is first mature when the consumer-driven aspect in Web 3.0 is turned around, right? Then the metaverse is mature too. So they were they realized what I was saying and jumped the boat a little bit fast because they want to capture it for themselves, right? But the metaverse and the miniverse are two aspects that are coming, but the miniverse is coming before the metaverse. 
and the metaverse involves that the web 3.0 um, is added. So to explain it in a simple way, right? So today when you go on the internet, you're only on the internet because you are a product. That's why the internet is free. So on the web 3.0, you have an entry point and any information that is pushed to you is pushed to you anonymous and you control it. Think about you have a wallet, a wallet of life, right? With, with your birth certificate and everything else. And you sh and and any information that is pushed to you, you decide that it's been pushed to you. You see the internet unfiltered. Today, you only see a version of what they they want to push to you, right? So um, that means that, so the entry points of where you connect to the information changes. That changes also the way that you actually can earn money on on Porsche to be relevant for you because you actually have money, you're interested in Porsche, it's the car you've driven for the last 10 years. So they're interested to connect directly to you because you are in a high rate of a new buyer for them, right? Right. Uh, Hendrik, since you mentioned the metaverse and miniverse and Web 3.0, can you please define a little bit all these three terms because they are too much like a buzzword across the internet. So I want my audience to yeah. be a bit of aware of all these terms. So in 2008, when the um, when I made the digital agenda, we realized three worlds are colliding together, right? So think about in 2008, the augmented reality merged, right? That's the physical world and the virtual world became into one, which is an augmented reality right so you can look at the warehouse how the warehouse would, would look at because it's a physical world and it's a virtual world and the augmented world is a representation on how the machines would work in a scenario thinking if you do two machines or if the sandwich so that's the augmented reality right and then you have the physical and the digital world connected together it becomes a cyber physical system so cyber physical system are really, really big in manufacturing, right? Because that's robot systems and digital sensory that works together, for example, warehouse to make it or to, to package the medicine and so on. So that's very, very strong on this, right? Then you have the metaverse. The metaverse is the physical, virtual and digital world connecting together. It, it creates a representations of the real world not only in augmented reality or in a virtual reality and a physical. So it's these three worlds connected together. So it's not what Meta says, you have a, a goggle on and you are in there in the virtual world for two hours and you get dizzy. No, no, it's the way you can share information. It's the way you share intellectual, intellectual capital. It's the way you do research and development in the collaborative way. So it, it becomes virtual digital and physical at the same time. It's not only virtual in an augmented reality. So in order to have that, you need to have a wallet lock on. So you identify yourself as a person and nobody can change who you are. You have a ledger of information sharing and that goes forth and back, right? So for that to happen, still many allies have to be, right? And then the, the, the other piece in the bio-revolution is the miniverse, right? The miniverse is how your body interconnects with digitally with the surrounding, with your own virtual reality, augmented reality, how you experience the world, how you feel, how you sense, right? So the bio-revolution has seven main pillars, right? One is the, the bio-software, right? That's the genes biochemistry programming, that's actually the living software. Then you have the biocomputing, which is data stored in the strands of your DNA. And then biosystems, which is the biosystems, how you neurons interfere with motors or digital motors outside. That can be a hand, that can be an implant, that can be implanted heart, that can be many aspects, right? So these three things, it's like the infrastructure highway to artificial intelligence. Then you have the promise of cure, which is the biomolecules. So when you see the promise of cure, we had like three waves. We had we have cured the basic diseases with antibiotics and with um and and with um vaccinations, right? The next phase is that we are curing 
um, specialized diseases like um, uh, cancer, special types of cancer that your family has, or um, if you're diabetic or so on, right? And then the other last pieces of the bio revolution is biotech food, right? So how we culture meat, how we create meat, um, food in a, in, a, in a very sustainable but really fast way, right? Um, how many people we are, we cannot create food how we are. And then we have smart materi materials, right? So today we have somehow declared carbon, so oil to be the big enemy. But in reality, it's the big solution that we have, right? Because uh, carbon is also a degradable material. So we need to create smart material where we can sense, feel, but it's also degradable and recyclable, right? And then the last piece is the big bio interface, right? So how is it that we alter and interconnect with our human reality and our feeling and our thoughts, how we can nudge them and how we experience reality, right? So that is actually the miniverse. That is where I interconnect with everything else, can monitor, control, feel, sense, I create a different reality, right? So it's exciting times we're going into. Yeah, exactly. And somewhere I read the word, the term industry 4.0. I mean, right now, the world is unable to handle industry 4.0 and unable to actually build the infrastructure successfully to build things around this industry 4.0. So, I mean, can you please a little bit tell what, what would be the... I'm just curious to know about this term. zero. What would be that? So Because in, intelligence in real, has no limit. Uh, I think artificial intelligence, the future of intelligence is that we humans have developed it and co-developed with artificial intelligence together. So our human evolution goes along with that now. We take it in a hand and goes hand in hand. We just have to decide who does what in which manner and how we are interrelating to it, right? So go back to my definition before, artificial intelligence is the automation of intelligence. We just have to define what the intelligence version of that is, right? Human intelligence is different than that. So to go back to you on the industry 4.0 question, right? I'm not I actually look quite hopeful to the future, right? I know we are in a stress, stress situation that we have compounding um, um, disruption that comes all the time, right? But the core of human being is our ability to adapt. And the centerpiece of the fourth industrial revolution is human beings. And even though it's the biggest disruption in human mankind, I believe that when challenges emerge, we have ability to collaborate together and to work together, right? It's not about which race we come from, which religion we come from, which values we come from, right? I think we merge together. Our differences is what makes us strong, right? And if we are working together from where we are, everybody has an ability to adapt to where they are. If they're in Africa, if they're in India, if they're in the US, if they're in Europe, we face different challenges and we have an ability to lift the table together, right? I think core of us being human, if we think less about ourselves and more about others, we will do fine, right? That's the first rule I would recommend, right? The centerpiece of the industry for the zero is to human beings. So we need to think together and always think about the other person first, right? I think the second rule that I would actually... Um, Re recommend we think we know so much but we know so little we know so little about how we work as human beings ourselves we don't understand fully what consciousness is we don't everybody experience the outside world different we don't we are we are on a learning journey one of the most exciting learning journey where we discover how much language really means for us as humans how much all of these, right? So as we evolve with AI, we connect with it, right? We are on, a, on, a, on an environment revolution where we try, we think that we are responsible for the environment and I'm a big proponent of that, right? But in reality, 
we have done the the carbon um uh, the, the carbon credit where we can see how everything goes from earth up to the hemisphere right but then we say ah oh, but what happens in the earth to here we don't really know so we don't care and what happens from the atmosphere down we also don't know so we also don't care right so we're a little bit like a children in a library that doesn't know how to read so we look at the pictures so we have so much still to discover um yes it, it, should we focus on saving the environment yes we should think about how we package how we produce how we are uh, in cycle with the universe all of this right but um many of these aspects we also don't know yet right so we should just try our best try and fail and try again and right and experience this part of being human right um the first the third recommendation is i have is that we have to be careful that the center of human life is not technology the center of human life is being human right so in silence you find yourself in silence you can innovate in silence right having time to communicate with people you are exploring yourself you are giving part of yourself to other people right that's not computers that's not phones that's not what app what's app that's not blocks that, right talking to people sensing how they feel supporting them nudging them on their own perspective of life right that is what makes us human right and life is experience as humans right when you eat food you forget the memory of what you ate but the experience of when you in the now when you eat food is amazing i love food right so but that's if you two days afterwards remember how did that curry really taste right well you just had the feeling that it was really amazing and you can describe it was hot and a little bit but you actually cannot really remember the taste right it's the same thing that science has has discovered right that people talk about their childhood like they can memorize and all of this but truth is most people cannot remember anything below the age of 8 everything that they remember is something that they have seen in the picture heard from their parents or from their sisters and brothers and so on right very few people really remember a true memory from there right because right so we are fooling ourselves in some way right we create a reality and that's that's these two beautiful things about consciousness if anybody takes something from this podcast right being human is actually suffering and there's a beauty in suffering because we sense we feel right we we explore each other right and the other part is that we alter our realities right we the only one that can alter our realities that we believe that everything will work in our advantage we believe in a better future we believe that we can do this right even though we fail we still are open to believe next time in it right we alter our, our realities about the past that somebody hurts us and we forgive them so we erase it that's the beauty thing of being human right we have the ability to forgive and to renew hope all right uh, hendrik human augmentation and brain computer interfaces are areas of active research what possibilities do these technologies hold for enhancing human intelligence in the future um uh, i i think i mentioned that before that's the main element in the in the universe in the bio revolution that's the next phase where artificial intelligence interconnects with our bodies and um strengthens how we see how we feel how we sense and how our muscles work the next question you know biasness in the algorithms is really a serious concern how this biasness could be addressed biasness i'm not sure if i understand what you mean with biasness bias bias i mean um, bias. you ask something 
Yeah, bias. Yeah, bias. Oh, um, of yeah. algorithm. Well, oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, algorithm should be biased. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think um, I think part of being biased is that um, we always need to know who programmed it. We need to know what we interact with. So there needs to be a watermark that it's a computer or it's a, it's it's generated from AI. And we need to have an age restriction on it and we need to tax it. Even though I'm repeating myself, they're the three most important things. All right. All right. So, Henrik, the concept of collective intelligence suggests that groups of individuals can achieve higher level of intelligence collectively than they can individually. How can we harness collective intelligence to solve complex problems in the future? Well, I think the metaverse um, will create a collect collective forum where we can sort and connect it, right? So, for example, um, so AI is not all bad, right? So, for example, all the patterns in medicine um can be looked at and then you can see what can be used in which manner, right? All the research can be validated. It will take ages of years for people to do that, right? So it can do some of the really, really cool cool tasks, right? And we can see the effects on altering DNA or plants DNA, right? So we can do scenario thinking and virtual augmented reality far better with AI than without AI. Collective intelligence is something quite important for humans. You have a collective intelligence with your wife. You have agreed on common elements, on common values. And that is something that you always sustain with trust, right? A community of col collective intelligence is always sustained by trust, right? You can say augmented um, a system, um, or um, autonomous systems is also a collective um, intelligence, but it's not really, right? It's it's systems in a car that interact together. They they sense what comes, they see, right? But the mission to drive the car and to protect the person is still the same, right? So um, collective intelligence by design never has an end goal, right? So you can collect a group, and you can design, for example, your your group that you have here on, on podcast is has the idea to to connect knowledge around and to develop itself with new insight and to inspire each other, right? So that means that has an overarching goal, but the goal itself evolves in many topics, right? It might be that you invite next week Ian McKinsey to talk about the right and left side of the brain, how that would work. So you don't talk about only one field, you talk about many fields, right? So um, that's uh, that's where collective intelligence goes through the back, right? We need collective intelligence to actually understand ourselves. All right. I really agree to your point. So Henrik, um, trust me, it's it it was really deep and uh, amazing conversation with you i mean so deep uh, when we talk on the intelligence so i'm really feeling so happy um having you on this podcast and uh, i'm really thankful to the person mr mohammed uh, azim iqbal and his uh, society named as pakistan society of industry engineers actually i searched you via that person that person suggested me to to call you on the podcast because he told me you are the father of industry 4.0 and if we call you on the podcast it will be really amazing and learning uh, oriented for many of our audiences in pakistan and across other regions so i'm really thankful to you for joining this podcast show and uh, in the last is not the question i ask every guest that comes to my show my audience is the young entrepreneurs university students teachers and business community and the people general in society so what message 
would you like to give to all my audience any message that could inspire them and make some impact on their life i think i i guess failing is part of life and we often don't accept it and if if we embrace failing then we also learn more from it um i think for every person where they stand everything will always work in its advantage right so um it's part of human being that we suffer that means we need to fail to understand what we really want and if that's what we really want and throughout that phase we evolve uh, our desires our feelings our wants our needs how we experience things so it's often not in the goal achieved but it's in the process that that we experience life all right henrik thank you so much for joining and uh, uh, giving the time today to the talks at innovation valley podcast i'm really thankful to you okay thank you